Hey everybody, uh, my name is Tom Cote. I am a professor in the biology department at Georgetown University. Today we are going to be talking about spiral ganglion neurons as part of Ear Central's 2020. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Today we're talking about spiral ganglion neurons. We're going to be focusing on aspects of their anatomy, in particular connectivity with hair cells, we will be talking about certain aspects of their development, and we will be talking about some important aspects uh, regarding spiral ganglion neurons and hearing loss. As always, please feel free to contact me by email. My email address is shown here. Uh, happy to help with anything uh, 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 in your own research regarding spiral ganglion neurons or to follow up with any issues that you may have as a result of this lecture. Okay. So that went forward. Uh, let's start out over here, looking at the schematic illustration of the inner ear, where you can see the cochlea over here on the left side of the page. Uh, it's coiling downward toward the ventral region of the animal. Uh, this is the dorsal region of the animal. Over here, we have the bony labyrinth, which comprises the vestibular system. We won't be talking about the innervation of the five different sensory patches within the vestibular system at all today. Uh, instead, we will be focusing on just the cochlea. So looking over to the right here on, your, on the right side of your screen, you can see we have a cross section of the cochlea that's equivalent to where I've drawn this green line over here. And you can see spiral ganglion neuron cell bodies uh, beautifully stained with an antibody against TUJ1. Uh, we also have anti-neurofilament staining on this preparation. So you can see the spiral ganglion neuron cell bodies here. They're so-called peripheral axons projecting up toward the inner and outer hair cells. And then the synaptic contacts here at the base of the inner hair cells. The hair cells uh, are labeled with antibodies against myosin-6 in this preparation. And I hope it goes without saying that uh, it is really just a privilege to study such a beautiful structure. This is something that I always like to emphasize. One of the things that I really love about doing work in the auditory system is just the sheer beauty that it presents. Okay, so why are these neurons so important? Well, Spiral ganglion neurons, along with the inner and outer hair cells, comprise the first neural component of the auditory pathway. So when we talk about sensory neural hearing loss, we're usually talking about hearing loss related to either hair cells or spiral ganglion neurons. And I, I just alluded to uh, hearing loss. And it turns out that both the synaptic contacts between spiral ganglion neurons and hair cells are often lost uh, or damaged in uh, cases of hearing loss or in moderate noise exposure. And there are also many cases where there is a loss of the spiral ganglion neuron cell bodies. And without these neurons, you simply uh, cannot transduce auditory information into the brain. Given that, it is true that hair cell regeneration or replacement will also require re -innervation. So there are uh, numerous uh, labs out there that are attempting to regenerate hair cells or replace hair cells using stem cell based therapies. And uh, anytime you have a new, uh, new hair cell or hair cell that has been regenerated, it will need to be uh, connected by a spiral ganglion neuron in order for that new hair cell to send auditory information into the brain. Likewise, uh, the greatest uh, neural prosthetic out there, the cochlear implant, 100% relies on the presence of spiral ganglion neurons. So if these neurons are not there, uh, or if they're not being maintained, the efficacy of cochlear implants will diminish. Okay, and so our learning goals for today are first considerations of the anatomy. I want to bring your attention to this whole mount immunostaining preparation of the postnatal day two cochlea. This is a uh, flat mount preparation where you can see the 
sample has been stained with TUJ1 antibodies. You can see the spiroganglion cell bodies down here. They are projecting their peripheral processes up into the hair cell region, which is approximately here. This is where the inner hair cells are. This is where the outer hair cells are. You can see, uh, as we'll talk about, the type 1 spiroganglion neurons uh, and the type 2 spiroganglion neurons here. But one thing that I really want to emphasize in this is that the spiroganglion neurons are not at all generic. In fact, we now know that there are at least three different subtypes of type 1 spiroganglion neurons. There may be subtypes of type 2 spiroganglion neurons. And they also have different kinds of firing properties depending on their region in the cochlea, whether they are uh, found in the base and act uh, in high frequency transduction, or they're found in the apex and participate in low frequency transduction. In terms of their development, uh, they undergo an interesting uh, process of development whereby a series of transcription factors uh, lead to their specification. Uh, they're also subjected to numerous uh, neurotrophins that are required for their survival. And uh, near and dear to my heart, they uh, are subject to a lot of different kinds of guidance cues that ensure that they either form synapses with inner or outer hair cells. One thing that's become clear over the past uh, decade, uh, at least, is that uh, the spiroganglion neurons are required to undergo this process of spontaneous activity, meaning that even before hearing onset, they uh, are firing and uh, they uh, are active as a result of glutamate uh, that is all happening in a uh, manner that is pre-hearing. This is required for their survival, uh, and probably some aspects of synaptic maturation. So we'll be talking about those issues, and we will talk, be talking about hearing loss. And so uh, one thing that's become clear over the past decade is that connectivity between spiral ganglion neurons and hair cells is not maintained after noise exposure. Uh, synapses become uh, damaged or destroyed. And so there are a lot of efforts now to learn about how those synaptic contacts can either be uh, regrown or maintained. And so one of the things that I like to do in this lecture is give everybody some tips on how to perform immunostaining or how to otherwise label the spiral ganglion neurons. We do this a lot in my lab, uh, and so I thought I would just offer some tips on how to do it. So uh, first of all, as shown here in this picture, this is TUJ1 immunostaining, as I noted before. Uh, TUJ1 is equivalent to beta-3 tubulin, which is a neural-specific uh, uh, tubulin isoform. As I've indicated here, uh, this antibody labels the spiroganglion cell bodies uh, and their processes. So you can see the spiroganglion cell bodies nicely labeled here and their axonal processes projecting up toward the hair cells. But within this compartment uh, where these radial bundles are, there are actually also the olivocochlear efferents that are uh, coming from the superior olivary complex. Uh, so these fibers are also labeled by TUJ1 antibodies. Okay, next we have uh, immunostaining with uh, neurofilament 200. All right, this is another common marker for mature neurons. Uh, and at certain stages, uh, particularly in early uh, part of spiral ganglion neuron development, we find that neurofilament 200 labels only spiral ganglion neurons and actually not efferents. So neurofilament 200 is shown here in magenta, and you can see the type 2 neurons that are projecting into the outer hair cell region. I should have said the type 2 spiral ganglion neurons. And then these magenta colored neurons are labeled with neurofilament 200, and these are the type 1s that are reaching up and making contacts with the inner hair cells. Uh, I'll note here that in green, we also have uh, antibodies against GAP43, uh, which has shown in the past uh, to be a, a marker for those efferents. So you can see quite distinctly uh, both the efferents and the afferents. Uh, I should note that the afferents are the spiral ganglion neurons. All right, next we have uh, immunostaining with this HUD antibody, also known as LBL4. 
as you can see here, it beautifully labels the spiral ganglion cell bodies, shown in green here. Now, uh, the advantage of HUD is that you really nicely see uh, the cell bodies, but you actually don't see any of the exonal processes. Uh, but it's a great marker for if you just need to uh, count spiral ganglion cell bodies. That's what we do in my lab. Uh, and uh, there are several out there that give really nice crisp staining. Okay, and then next, uh, this illustrates some technology that we adopted from Lisa Goodrich's lab. Uh, this is what we call sparse neuronal labeling. So if you just want to examine a single spiral ganglion neuron and look at its projections up into the hair cell region, you can uh, take your mouse lines, cross them to uh, a Rosa 26 uh, reporter. Uh, this is the Rosa 26 TD tomato reporter. Uh, along with one of these Cree ERT2, these tamoxifen inducible uh, uh, Cree lines. This works really well with the Neurogenin 1 Cree ERT2 line uh, that came from Lisa Goodrich's lab. Uh, it is available at JAX. The SOX2 Cree ERT2 line, uh, which is also available at JAX, uh, uh, accomplishes the same thing. Now, this is actually uh, without tamoxifen. And again, I'd be happy to share methods uh, for this. But this is a really nice way of uh, taking, instead of uh, one of these bulk labeling strategies where you see all of the neural tissue, you have the opportunity to just trace individual neurons. And this allows you to look at where the neurons are forming contacts with the hair cells and uh, whether there might be any kinds of morphological abnormalities uh, at the ends of these fibers. Okay, so in this slide, what, we're, what I wanted to do is just reorient you to some uh, general inner ear anatomy that you probably saw in a previous lecture, just noting where the spiral ganglion cell bodies were and their peripheral pro processes uh, with respect to the, um, the entirety of the inner ear. And so we are now going to uh, focus on the organ of corti and the different kinds of neural fibers that are innervating the hair cells. Uh, there are four different kinds of, four different general classes of neurons in the inner ear. Uh, there are the type one and two afferent. Uh, these are synonymous with spiral ganglion neurons. Uh, the afferents carry acoustic information uh, and auditory pain information away from the cochlea into the brain. Uh, that is the definition of an afferent. So the type one spiral ganglion neurons, they exclusively form synapses only with inner hair cells. These are the green fibers shown here, forming contacts with inner hair cells. This constitutes 95% of the entire spiral ganglion neuron population. Then there are the type twos, uh, the small minority of fibers uh, shown here passing the inner hair cell and uh, uh, projecting into the outer hair cell region. As we'll note a little bit later uh, in this lecture, they all turn toward the base, but as they turn toward the base, uh, which, which isn't really shown here, they all make multiple contacts with outer hair cells. So these are considered afferents, but uh, what they do is somewhat mysterious, and we think that they have to do uh, with auditory nociception. Okay, and then there are efferents. And in both cases, efferents are thought to provide inhibitory feedback. Uh, there are the MOCs. I know you guys are going to get uh, more content on this later in ear essentials, uh, but there are the MOCs that form contacts with the outer hair cells. Uh, this is thought to uh, uh, inhibit outer hair cell motility. There are the LOCs. Uh, sorry, I should have mentioned that the MOCs, this stands for medial superior olivary complex neurons. Uh, the cell bodies are in the superior olivary complex and they send these thin projections down into the cochlea. Uh, there are also, there are neurons from the lateral superior olivary complex. Those formed so-called axodendritic contacts with the type one spiral ganglion neurons. Uh, what they do, uh, to my knowledge, uh, is uh, uh, not entirely unknown, but uh, 
uh, I know that they provide uh, some level of inhibition as well. And so just a little bit more in terms of the anatomical features of spiral ganglion neurons, uh, they are bipolar, uh, similar to other sensory neurons, uh, and they're housed in the cochlea along the spiral. Uh, as you heard in previous lectures, uh, there is a, a tonotopic orientation, uh, tono tonotopic arrangement of the cochlea with high frequency regions at the base and low frequency regions at the apex. Here is where the myosin-6 positive hair cells are around the lateral edge of the cochlear epithelium. The spiral ganglion neuron cell bodies are shown here. They have peripheral axons that uh, form contacts with the hair cells. Here are those cell bodies and then central axons that project into the cochlear nucleus. Spiral ganglion neurons, they have this one-to-one -one relationship with hair cells. Uh, what, what I mean by that is that uh, a single peripheral axon only contacts a single hair cells, a ha single hair cell. The peripheral axons, uh, while they are bifurcated and branched early in development, uh, by maturation, they contact just a single hair cell. Uh, however, uh, individual hair cells can have up to uh, 20 or 25 spiral ganglion fibers uh, that have uh, synaptic contacts with them. The spiral ganglion neurons, they're bipolar, as I mentioned before, but they don't behave like a textbook neuron. A uh, textbook neuron looks more like a neuron with a cell body and unmyelinated dendrites, and then a long axon with myelination. Turns out that the spiral ganglion neurons are myelinated throughout uh, their, their entire projection from the hair cell to the brain. There's a little region at the base of the hair cells, or actually at the base of the supporting cells, called the habenula perforata, and this is where myelination starts with uh, the spiral ganglion neurons. Actually, I correct myself, this is just type one spiral ganglion neurons. The myelination begins by Schwann cells uh, at the habenula, and it exists all the way uh, uh, into the CNS. Now, interestingly, there's this transition point where uh, Schwann cells uh, transition to oligodendrocytes within the CNS, uh, and the mechanisms that facilitate that difference uh, must be really interesting and are unknown. Okay, but nevertheless, both the peripheral and central processes are myelinated, and uh, the action potential uh, starts around the base of the hair cell and actually hops along the nucleus, or hops uh, over the nucleus, and then continues on into the brain. All right, so there is this continuous action potential. Oh, and I just wanted to point out that uh, the spiral ganglion neurons are similar to uh, bipolar, right? Or uh, pseudo unipolar neurons. We'll bring up the 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 um, uh, the type two neurons in just a moment. But the type one neurons, type one spiral ganglion neurons, are very similar to uh, bipolar neurons in that they are uh, myelinated along the extent of uh, both their peripheral and central processes. Uh, it's just that spiral ganglion neurons are a little bit different in that they do not have uh, these multiple contacts. Uh, uh, mul oh, they don't form multiple synaptic contacts. Okay, yes, and I just wanted to mention So I next wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, spir type one spiral ganglion neuron diversity. And to begin this conversation, I wanted to uh, point out some of the really fantastic work that was done by Charlie Lieberman uh, some years ago. I'm turning to Penn here. And this work starts out with some really heroic physiology experiments. Uh, whereby Charlie monitored uh, uh, using single unit recordings the physiological characteristics of individual type 1 spiral ganglion neurons. And then after doing so, filled those neurons with a dye called horseradish peroxidase so he could actually then trace the neurons back to their synaptic contact along the inner hair cell. Uh, 
And what was found from this work was something quite interesting, was that there was variation in the morphology of the neurons and that this corresponded with, uh, uh, with differences in spontaneous firing rates. In particular, there are these thick type one spiral ganglion neurons that tended to have high rates of spontaneous discharge. These also were those that had uh, low threshold sensitivities. And what we mean by that, oops, sorry about that, is that it did not take a lot of sound input in order to get those neurons to depolarize. On the other hand, there are these thin type one spiral ganglion neurons. Those are shown here. And instead of forming contacts on the pillar cell side of the inner hair cell, like these thick ones do, they tended to form synaptic contacts along the medialar face. All right, so the pillar cells are over here and the more medial or what's called the medialar face of the inner hair cells is over here. Those neurons tended to have a low rate of spontaneous discharge. And in contrast with their thicker counterparts on the other side of the hair cell, they tend to only depolarize in, uh, uh, in the presence of relatively loud sounds. So while there are these different characteristics, I wanted to point out that uh, some of the firing properties may not be entirely dictated by the morphology uh, or, um, or different, by, by the morphology or intrinsic aspects of the postsynaptic neuron, but that there could be aspects of the presynaptic ribbon synapse, uh, uh, particularly in terms of the active zone uh, and activity there that may facilitate differences in postsynaptic responses. Uh, I also, so I, I mentioned uh, this correlation with inner hair cell position, uh, but it was also found uh, that uh, the thicker neurons tend to have, tended to have higher mitochondrial content. Uh, I also wanted to mention that there is a potentially, uh, or, or it was found that there was this um, medium or middle uh, spontaneous rate group right, or a population of neurons that seem to fall somewhere in the middle of these neurons, both in terms of uh, uh, their synaptic location, uh, their firing characteristics, and their morphology. Okay, so now I'm going to take this uh, recorded component of this lecture and splice it into a recorded conversation that I had uh, with an undergraduate of mine, Talia Inbar, uh, so you'll see us up in the upper right-hand uh, corner of the screen. There are distinctions uh, between these neurons, and I will get to that in just a moment, but I wanted to show this uh, image from my, my own lab, uh, where you can see with this individual labeling technique, uh, both uh, thick uh, fibers projecting toward uh, the backside of the, of the inner hair cell here, and thin fibers projecting to the front side, this is uh, more of that medialar side. And the other side is the pillar cell side. You can see it rotating here. This is using that sparse labeling technique. And hopefully uh, everybody in the audience can see uh, this thick one projecting to the back side of the inner hair cell, this thin one projecting to uh, the front or uh, medialar side of the inner hair cell. And yeah, it's possible, uh, although this immunosinity does not reveal this, and this arrow should be pointing here, is that this thin one could be one of those uh, um, low spontaneous discharge rate fibers, whereas this thicker one could be one of those higher spontaneous rate fibers. Okay. In the last couple of years, there have been some real landmark papers that have come uh, from three different groups that have identified uh, three different subtypes of spiral ganglion fibers. And this is shown just in cartoon diagram here. We don't have time in this uh, presentation to go over all the details of this. But using uh, single cell RNA-seq technology, uh, three different labs found that there were uh, three different subtypes uh, labeled here as 1A, 1B, and 1C. And in all likelihood, uh, the 1A family uh, represent those uh, high spontaneous rate fibers, the 1B, the middle spontaneous rate fibers, and the 1C family of low spontaneous rate fibers. 
And uh, there is, of course, work ongoing um, in my lab, and actually uh, with great help from Talia here, who's on this Zoom call, uh, we have uh, identified some antibodies that really nicely identify the three subtypes. And for anybody listening to this, uh, please feel free to uh, contact us if you would like the methods on how to uh, perform this immunostaining. So here we're looking at uh, CALB1, uh, pal 4 f one and CALB2. Uh, if I remember correctly, CALB2 is the uh, high spontaneous rate uh, subtype, CALB1 is the medium, and pal 4 f one is the low spontaneous rate subtype. So we talked about um, the type 1s and the type 2s and their projection patterns, and um, one thing that I think I failed to mention actually is that uh, both of these uh, fibers type uh, um, form uh, glutamatergic synapses. So both the inner and the outer hair cells release glutamate onto uh, either type one or type two neurons. Um, however, it's been shown recently that the type two neurons themselves are actually sensitive to ATP signaling. Uh, and that has been shown in the context of outer hair cell damage. And that actually gets us to one of the things that I wanted to talk about, which was um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the function of type two spiral ganglion neurons. And what I didn't mention before was that this is just the minority of the spiral ganglion population. This is just five to 10% of the total. Um, but they can synapse, I say here, up to 10, 10 outer hair cells. I think it's actually more, maybe more like 15 to 20 outer hair cells. Um, but for, for quite some time, since about 2009, we've known that they are glutamatergic and that outer hair cells will fire glutamate onto the uh, type 2 spiral ganglion neurons. But what Kat Weiss found was that it took a relatively strong input or the simultaneous release of numerous hair cells uh, to actually uh, new, simultaneous release of glutamate by numerous hair cells to actually get a type 2 spiral ganglion fi uh, fiber to fire. Um, from Paul Fuchs's lab, we now know that uh, these neurons have the ability to report cochlear damage by responding to ATP. Uh, we'll get into that in just a moment. From a morphological standpoint, you can see here that the type 2 neurons are, uh, are actually a little bit different than the type 1s. They are uh, more pseudo-unipolar, so they're actually more like, uh, even more like a DRG uh, sensory neurons. Uh, and in fact, they're actually more like the pain-sensing fibers, the C-fibers of the somatosensory system. And interestingly, unlike the type 1s, the type 2s are not myelinated. And you can see in this uh, cross-section uh, of the auditory nerve. You can see the type 1s that don't have this dark ring of myelination like the type 1s do. So this is a type 2, and this is clearly a type 1 uh, with the Schwann cells forming this thick myelin sheath. Okay, so don't have too many details here in this lecture, uh, but um, the uh, uh, there, there were a couple, back in 2015, there were a couple of nice papers suggesting some interesting function of the type 2 spiral ganglion neurons. And in uh, this paper, the authors actually used uh, these BGLU3 knockout mice that lack uh, normal auditory sensitivity or canonical hearing, and they were able to show that uh, there was cochlear nucleus activation that was consistent with the presence of type 2 spiral ganglion neurons after uh, this so-called painful noise was, uh, um, well, after mice were exposed to the so-called painful noise. But I think more convincing uh, that the neurons can, can respond to cochlear damage was a series of experiments done by the Fuchs lab showing that if you damage outer hair cells, uh, uh, this would lead to these depolarization events that were clearly dependent on extracellular ATP. So drugs that, that blocked uh, the release of, of ATP from uh, outer supporting cells would block uh, these ATP-dependent uh, uh, ATP depolarization events. 
All right, so I'd, I'd like us to next think about development. So one of the things that I think is really fascinating about how the spiral ganglion neurons develop is that it's really a four-dimensional process, meaning you have your three-dimensional cochlea, but they are developing in really interesting ways when the cochlea is growing upward, outward, and spiraling. And so in order to think about uh, SGN development, you really have to think about uh, uh, how the cochlea is extending uh, in multiple dimensions. Um, nevertheless, this is really a typical paradigm of neuronal differentiation, uh, where you have a series of transcription factors that lead to their development and specification. They then delaminate from an epithelium, which then leads to their migration. Uh, they then have to migrate uh, into this coiled structure, uh, which is uh, the way that they do that is still somewhat unknown. Uh, they then have to undergo this process of uh, pathfinding and target selection uh, in order to make appropriate contacts with inner and outer hair cells. Uh, they then have to form uh, synapses with inner and outer hair cells. So there's this really interesting process of synaptogenesis. Uh, and we're going to go through uh, some of the details of these things. So in mouse, so here we have a timeline of, of, of spiral ganglion neuron development in mouse. And really development begins starting about embryonic day eight. All right. And you know, initially we thought hearing onset is approximately postnatal day 10 or 12. And when I started working in spiral ganglion neurons, my assumption was that that was it for their development. But it turns out that it's really a much longer process. And between hearing onset uh, and about post day 30, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that happens. Uh, nevertheless, early on, uh, there is this process of neurogenesis. And the neurons start out as part of this uh, embryonic structure called the otocyst. They then uh, form neuroblasts as a result of transcriptional activity from neurogen one and neuro D, uh, two, um, two critical transcription factors. They then undergo this process of uh, migration and maturation. And it's known that uh, GATA3 and slit robo signaling are really important for migration. Uh, this occurs uh, um, in between approximately uh, embryonic day nine and embryonic day 16, as the cochlea begins to coil. Uh, during these early phases, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, the neuroblasts form the structure called the cochlear vestibular ganglion. The cochlear vestibular ganglion uh, will then partition into a vestibular uh, and then an auditory component as the otocyst itself partitions into a vestibular and an auditory component. But you can see the spiral ganglion neurons are now um, innervating the auditory system while the vestibular neurons are uh, innervating the five different sensory patches within the vestibular system. Within the uh, auditory system, the spiral ganglion neurons between about embryonic day 14 and postnatal day two undergo this process of axon outgrowth and guidance. I've also put here uh, this process of the spiral ganglion neuron debranching. We don't have time to go into it, but the spiral ganglion neurons undergo this really interesting process of debranching, whereby they start out uh, with these elaborate branches uh, and end up um, uh, refining back these elaborate branches before they make that one-to-one -one contact. Uh, there is uh, terminal differentiation during the formation of ribbon synapses, uh, and this is mediated in part by the transcription factor uh, called MAFB. And what is not easily seen here uh, is that there is finally this process of synaptic pruning. Uh, interestingly, uh, there are about twofold too many synapses that are formed in the cochlea. Uh, those, many of those are pruned back as a result of uh, both thyroid hormone signaling 
uh, and signaling between F receptors and efferin ligands. Uh, and uh, throughout this process, uh, the spiral ganglion neurons are subjected to uh, neurotrophin signaling. And if you remove the neurotrophins, uh, the spiral ganglion neurons tend to die. So really early in development, the spiral ganglion neurons, as we, as we talked, uh, they, um, they come from the otocyst. But before they come from the otocyst, the otocyst actually has to undergo some patterning. Uh, and so the same kind of axial patterning that leads to uh, the anterior posterior axis of the embryo uh, uh, confers a uh, patterning within the otocyst. So actually it turns out that retinoic acid from the posterior region of the embryo uh, and retinoic acid degradation from the more anterior region of the embryo leads to the formation of this particular part of the otocyst called the neural sensory domain. Once you have the neural sensory domain, uh, you then can have uh, the, 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 uh, uh, a neural fate that emerges after neurogen 1 uh, transcriptional activity. Then there are other, uh, that is along with other uh, transcription factors within the neural sensory domain. Once you have uh, uh, the formation of neuroblasts, they can undergo uh, delamination through this interesting um, uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, whereby you have little neuroblasts that are coming off the epithelial tissue. This is a cross section of the cochlea at embryonic day 10 and a half, and where it has been labeled uh, with antibodies against SOX10. And you can see all of the otocyst tissue here, and you can actually see uh, these glial cells that are also SOX10 positive. Here are spiral ganglion neurons that are actually departing the otocyst here. These are labeled with TUJ1. You can see here this interesting process of epithelial to mesenchymal transition where the neurons are coming out of the otocyst and then they're meeting up with the glia, which come from uh, the neural crest. These are the uh, uh, eventual Schwann cells. And so they are uh, converging here at about embryonic day 10 and a half. Okay, so I mentioned this epithelial to mesenchymal transition, all right, and then uh, shortly after the EMT. Okay, this is just a schematic of uh, what's known about epithelial to mesenchymal transition. I've always thought that it would be really interesting to try to understand how the spiral ganglion neurons, uh, they delaminate from the otocyst. Uh, I should also mention that at this stage, uh, many of these neurons could also be uh, vestibular neurons. But part of the epithelial to mesenchymal transition is always the downregulation of uh, epithelial factors, uh, in particular junctional proteins that mediate the adhesion between these epithelial cells. That then convert, confers on these cells more of a mesenchymal characteristic uh, where they have the ability to actually migrate. And I misspoke just a little bit. Uh, it turns out that it's actually not just the spiral ganglion, but again, this cochlear vestibular ganglion. And this is a really nice segue uh, into thinking about uh, the birth dating of neurons within the inner ear. All right, so the question is, which ones of these neurons comes first, whether it's the uh, vestibular or the auditory or spiral ganglion neurons? And it turns out that it's the vestibular neurons that are born first. But what's interesting is that by embryonic day 14, the neurons clearly have uh, axonal processes that project into the epithelium uh, and also into uh, uh, the brainstem. And it's actually at this early stage of embryonic day 14 where they start to show the very first signs of uh, physiological firing characteristics. Um, it's at about embryonic day 14 or embry embryonic day 15 where the spiral ganglion neurons start to uh, uh, form uh, selective uh, contacts with either inner or outer hair cells. And as I noted before, the neurons uh, go from being highly branched to unbranched. Uh, E15 and beyond, uh, the epithelium continues to extend. And it's this 
process, it's this point where the spiral ganglion neurons, they form these really thick radial bundles uh, and they start to have interactions with mesenchyme cells. Uh, the type two neurons, uh, they then start extending into the outer hair cell region and then turn toward the base. This all begins around E15, but really also extends uh, through about postnatal day two. In terms of uh, type one and type two pathfinding, there are some really interesting aspects of this. It turns out that um, most of the uh, uh, neurons, actually I should say about 50% of all spiral ganglion neurons actually begin their life out in the outer hair cell region. For the neurons that are the type ones, they will actually sort of swim around out here and explore the type, the um, outer hair cell region uh, and then retract back where they will form synaptic contacts with the inner hair cells. And then by about postnatal day zero or postnatal day one, you can see the mature configuration with the type one spiral ganglion neurons forming contacts with the inner hair cells and the type two spiral ganglion neurons projecting into the outer hair cell region and then turning toward the base. Starting uh, at this stage through about uh, um, postnatal day eight or so, there is really a lot of pruning that goes on uh, and refinement uh, that then allows, or that then leads to that one-to-one -one contact between an individual spiral ganglion neuron and an inner hair cell. And then uh, the type two neurons that extend down toward the base and form multiple contacts with outer hair cells. And I actually have no idea why I put this cross-sectional cartoon in at this point. Uh, I have no idea. But in terms of uh, mechanisms, uh, Noah Druckenbrod from Lisa Goodrich's lab. Um, uh, oh yes, this is why. Uh, they uh, begin their projection I say that presumptive type two neurons begin their pathfinding near the scale of tympani. All right, so the scale of tympani is down here. Uh, anatomically, the type two neurons start their life a little bit uh, uh, lower toward the scale of tympani as opposed to the efferents, which uh, uh, project into the outer hair cell region uh, closer to the scale of media. Uh, there are a couple of papers, uh, including one from uh, my group when I was a postdoc in Matt Kelly's lab, uh, that, discuss some of the uh, inhibitory guidance cues that are expressed in the outer hair cell region. Uh, one is FRNA5, which is expressed in the outer hair cell region. Another is semaphorin 3F, also expressed in the outer hair cell region. And both of these guidance cues provide repulsive information to the type ones that then restrict uh, the type ones to the inner hair cells. And so if you lose either FRNA5 or semaphorin 3F, uh, expression in, these, in this outer hair cell region, you get excessive numbers of type one fibers projecting into the outer hair cell region. I think we have just one data point shown here. Uh, this is actually a, a receptor now for semaphorin 3F. Uh, this is a, a neuropillin 2 mutant over here. And this is a, a, a wild type littermate uh, this is with the sparse labeling approach, where hopefully you can appreciate that there are more uh, labeled fibers in the outer hair cell region from the neuropillin 2 mutant uh, compared to uh, its wild type litter. Okay, and this is just a cartoon illustration of this where semaphorin 3F is expressed in the outer hair cell region and leads to the restriction of type one neurons uh, at the... So Tali, one thing that I didn't um, mention, this is a, a relatively... Uh, old series of slides is that we now know uh, that, uh, and, and, and our lab is now working on this, is that there are some known guidance mechanisms of how the type twos actually project toward the base. So you know, notice that they have this really nice characteristic mm -hmm. 90 degree turn. And it turns out that the supporting cells have what are called planar cell polarity cues that mediate this characteristic turning. And this is uh, the work from Satish, and, uh, who's now in our lab, who was in Michael Deans's lab. Uh, we are now working on uh, how different efferin cues within the outer hair cell uh, supporting cell region uh, also contribute to this process. 
this really elaborate process of spontaneous activity in spiral ganglion neurons that happens as a prelude to hearing onset. Uh, we don't have time to go into all of the uh, elaborate mechanisms. This is uh, this is stuff that's come out of Dwight Bergel's lab uh, for the past uh, 10 or 12 years. And there's this really fascinating mechanism by which uh, supporting cells, they release ATP onto themselves that then stimulates this fluid secretion mechanism that then drives activity of inner hair cells, uh, glutamate release then onto the spiral ganglion neurons and spontaneous activity that you can visualize uh, uh, within the spiral ganglion neurons. And again, this all happens uh, prior to hearing onset. And presumably the function of this is to help facilitate uh, 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 synaptic maturation. I have here uh, this, this sort of in cartoon form spontaneous activity in hair cells and spiral ganglion neurons, but really what we found now is that this box could be extended all the way back until about E14 uh, or E15. Uh, and actually, uh, George Spirou showed a number of years ago that the spiral ganglion neurons are electrically active as early as embryonic day 14. Nevertheless, uh, it's really uh, fantastic to visualize this pre-hearing spontaneous activity. Uh, this is the activity that is uh, visualized through a G-CAMP construct. Uh, this is now PAX2 CRE, which is driving G-CAMP, which, uh, which um, uh, results in the broad expression of G-CAMP. So you're going to see it in both epithelial cells and spiral ganglion neurons. This is from a 2016 paper from Dwight's lab. And it never gets old watching these movies where you can see these pre-hearing bursts of activity uh, they are synchronized with, uh, you can see them in the epithelial cells and there are these synchronized uh, 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 bursts of activity in the spiral ganglion cells. This is using a different Cree line, uh, again, using G-CAMP. Uh, with this Cree line here, it's just expressed in the spiral ganglion neurons themselves. And you can see this lightning storm of activity within the spiral ganglion neurons. Uh, this is all a result of, uh, of pre-hearing glutamate being released from uh, the spiral ganglion or from the hair cells as a result of uh, ATP activity in those neighboring supporting cells. Just playing the movie again for everybody's enjoyment. So as I alluded to, <clears throat> all of this activity <coughs> in the epithelial cells results in ATP being released uh, actually onto the supporting cells themselves. This then leads to this uh, fluid secretion mechanism that ultimately leads to uh, ATP, uh, sorry, uh, glutamate being released onto the spiral ganglion cells. In the Burgos lab, they identified uh, NMDA receptors as possible targets of this glutamate during spontaneous activity. And while those NMDA receptors were required for activity, they also found that the loss, looks like I forgot to include some data. Um, the loss of NMDA receptors also led to the loss of spiral ganglion neurons. So it turns out that activity through NMDA receptors is actually required for spiral ganglion neuron survival. Okay. So we talked about the morphological development of the spiral ganglion neurons. We talked about uh, uh, various aspects related to axon guidance and spontaneous activity. And I next wanted to just mention a few things related to the tonotopic organization of the spiral ganglion neurons. <clears throat> 
So the cochlea is, uh, has a frequency map. It has a, um, uh, it is organized in this tonotopic array where the bass most preferentially responds to high frequency sounds and the apex most preferentially responds to low frequency sounds. So I also wanted to mention uh, in, in terms of tonotopic organization that it's really interesting. The tonotopic organization of the spiral ganglion neurons actually is preserved all the way through the ascending auditory system. And you can see this really nicely in the brainstem where the central projections of the spiral ganglion neurons project into uh, both the um, uh, dorsal and ventral cochlear nucleus or cochlear nuclei. And it turns out that, that as, as I mentioned before, the tonotypic identity is preserved. And so if you were to label the uh, high frequency neurons in the base of the cochlea, you would actually see within the central, or sorry, within the brainstem or the cochlear nucleus, that there would be uh, the presence of those low or high frequency neurons in the more dorsal region of the cochlear nucleus here and over here, whereas neurons from the apex of the cochlea or the low frequency neurons could be found in the more uh, uh, ventral region of the cochlear nucleus here and over here. One other aspect of, uh, uh, one other interesting aspect of the spiral ganglion neurons is that you know, they have different tuning curves. And so uh, the tuning curve by definition is its most sensitive uh, characteristic frequency. So if you were to do a single unit recording from a single neuron uh, and then uh, play different tones into the ear at different intensities, the lowest intensity uh, sound input that caused uh, depolarization, right? So all of these uh, little dots uh, indicate when a neuron spikes. And you can see here that at uh, uh, a thousand hertz is when you can play very, very quiet tones into the ear and get a really nice spiking activity. And so uh, authors of uh, data like this would identify that one neuron as having uh, a characteristic frequency of a thousand hertz. And if you were to do that on all different neurons, you would see that uh, each neuron, so here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different neurons, actually have uh, completely different characteristic frequencies. And so what accounts for this? Uh, one possibility is that it's just strictly the basilar membrane, or it could be that the neurons actually have different kinds of identities. Uh, they might express different uh, kinds of uh, factors related to uh, physiological firing of neurons that give them different kinds of frequencies or different kinds of firing characteristics based on their frequency. Okay, so finally I wanted to go into a few slides on <coughs> some relatively recent work on spiral ganglion neurons and hearing loss. And for a long time, I would say before I was a postdoc working on the auditory system, the, the dogma was that you lose hair cells or you lose hair cells and epithelial cells, and that led to a loss of spiral ganglion neurons. But there wasn't really an appreciation for the, <coughs> the, the vulnerability of the synaptic contacts between spiral ganglion neurons and hair cells. Um, before I go into that, I just wanted to mention this sort of, uh, sort of illustration of this, um, this sort of what, what, what I now view as an antiquated concept. This is a a uh, mouse that's deficient in this transcription factor of POW4F3, which is uh, expressed only in hair cells. The loss of POW4F3 leads to a loss of, of hair cells and malformed supporting cells. And perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the loss of 
those cells also leads to a loss of spiral ganglion neurons, presumably because these uh, um, uh, in the spiral ganglion neurons that are there are not getting the appropriate trophic support. Uh, they're not getting any activity from the hair cells, and so they die. But from a clinical perspective, I don't think that's really the most important issue. And in 2009, perhaps one of the most important papers uh, in the recent few decades was from Sharon Kujawa and Charlie Lieberman and how they found that sort of moderate noise or what, what I think of as industrial noise could have really long-term consequences to spiral ganglion neurons because that noise tends to destroy the synaptic contacts um, here uh, at these sites called ribbon synapses. Okay, and what they found was that they, if they exposed mice to just moderate levels of noise, that instead of the hair cells dying, which is what would happen in uh, extreme noise conditions or in really toxic noise conditions, they found that the hair cells were just fine. Uh, here you can see the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells, but what they found were these, these little, um, these uh, synaptic contacts that had a presynaptic site labeled by CTBP2, but lacked a postsynaptic site. These are these so-called orphan synapses. In this particular noise exposure paradigm, this is called, uh, this is called a uh, reversible hearing loss or temporary threshold shift. This is eight to 16 kilohertz at 100 decibels for two hours. So there is actually temporary hearing loss. But in this noise exposure paradigm, uh, there isn't permanent hearing loss because the hair cells are preserved. But what was interesting from this was that even though the hair cells are preserved, it turned out that long after exposure, the spiral ganglion neurons began to die. So this is actually 64 weeks post-exposure. So this is quite a long time after the exposure period. But this followed, um, actually, let me just, uh, okay. I couldn't remember exactly what I had on here. The important thing here is that in this moderate noise exposure, the synaptic contacts between the uh, inner hair cells and the spiral ganglion neurons they die off, all right? There is uh, not immediately a loss of spiral ganglion neurons in terms of neuronal death, but it's a sort of retraction of these synapses away from, sorry, retraction of the fibers away from the synapses. And then eventually there would be, there is a loss of the spiral ganglion cells. Okay, this is just some of the auditory brain stem response data showing that um, uh, in contrast with one day after exposure where there is this uh, change in hearing threshold, eight weeks after exposure, there is this recovery. So the green line is the control group and uh, two and eight weeks after exposure, basically the mice can hear normally. However, long after this period, their spiral ganglion neurons begin to die and this presumably causes uh, a significant hearing loss. Okay. So Talia, this is actually something that you were asking about earlier. And it turns out that these low spontaneous rate spiral ganglion neurons are the most susceptible to death after noise damage. Uh, this has been shown uh, uh, by groups more recently uh, using those more uh, uh, molecular identifiers of the uh, type 1C fibers. And how in the context of uh, um, noise exposure, those type 1C fibers tend to be the ones uh, that die first. Those are the same neurons as these, presumably as these low spontaneous rate fibers. More recently, there has been uh, this clinical term called hidden hearing loss. Hidden hearing loss is what I had mentioned earlier, which is the inability to hear 
uh, or filter out noise in noisy environments like a restaurant or a bar. And the thought is that underlying that is this loss of low spontaneous rate fibers. So there is again a lot of effort uh, out there now to try and either regrow or preserve these low spontaneous rate fibers as a way to potentially uh, mitigate or cure uh, hidden hearing loss. Okay, and of course, what this all means is that uh, industrial noise that may not immediately impact hair cells could have long-term damage to the scarborough ganglion neuron. So everybody should be really good about uh, wearing hearing protection, especially when doing something like cutting concrete, which is horribly noisy. So we talked a lot about the anatomical aspects of the spiral ganglion neurons, the different subtypes, uh, the regional variation. We talked about, uh, in, in terms of the development, the transcriptional cascades, uh, how they are uh, subjected to neurotrophins, how neurotrophins are required for uh, their maintenance. We talked a little bit about uh, the guidance of the spiral ganglion neurons in terms of uh, inner hair cells and outer hair cells, and I mentioned this really interesting aspect of spontaneous activity uh, and how it's required for their uh, connectivity and spiral ganglion neuron survival and um, maturation. And then in numerous occasions today, I talked about hearing loss and how contacts, synaptic contacts between uh, spiral ganglion neurons and hair cells uh, uh, are sensitive to noise exposure. 